Minnesota needs one more throw to be complete. Larson finds Vinoka, and it is all over! In one of the most stunning championship weekends of all time, the Minnesota Windchill are the wind champions in Salt Lake City. Ben Feldman's Minnesota Windchill, champions of the Ultimate Frisbee Association 2024. back it's swing pass the minnesota windchill are your 2024 ultimate frisbee association champions after a windy and wild championship weekend out in salt lake city utah i am adam ruffner that is cameron brock and we are here to recap the biggest and most exciting weekend from the 2024 season again the four seed out of the final four teams, takes home the trophy, showing absolute resolve and total team play against the two most heavily favored teams in the field, Minnesota knocking off the D.C. Breeze in their semifinal game and then handling Carolina 17-16 to in an absolute thriller of a championship finale. Minnesota jumping out to an 8-2 lead in that game before the Flyers Battled all the way back, tying it up midway through the fourth quarter and setting up for an absolutely scintillating finish to the entire season. We'll get to all three games, but Cam, I unfortunately was not able to join you all out there. I've been sick and laid up the past week, but what was it like out there, out in Zion's Bank Stadium, out in all that wind, but also with all that excitement? I was just so riveted throughout the entirety of that that championship matchup knowing from my minnesota roots that even as the wind chill took that massive first half lead that we were nowhere close to finish when it came with this again chaos season that just continued <laughs> to i think surprise and amaze us all right down to the final few moments yeah i mean it was a great atmosphere. Uh, the fans really showed up. I thought it was uh, amazing to see Salt Lake City just show up, even though I'm sure a lot of the fans were disappointed not to see the shred there. And and in talking to many of them, they were disappointed, but they were still extremely excited to you know be hosting Championship Weekend, and they wanted to be a part of that experience. So really cool of the fans out there to just like show up and you know get ready for some frisbee. And man. We have a lot of Swing Pass fans out in Salt Lake City, and I got to shout all of you out because the amount of people from, you know, middle school and high school kids all the way up to, you know, parents and even some some grandparents, the amount of people out there that came up to me and said, oh, oh, Cam, we love Swing Pass. Like it, it was it was not what I was expecting, but it was very cool, very appreciated. So to all of you that came up to me personally and, you know, chatted with me and and shared just how much you love Frisbee with me. I mean, that was that was amazing. And man, it is uh, quite a community out there. I was really blessed to meet a lot of people. And then the, the Frisbee, I mean, the Frisbee itself, like it wasn't the prettiest ultimate that we've ever seen, but we had four games or sorry, three games that were, you know, competitive pretty much all the way to the end. Even, even though some of the scores ended up being three or four goals, those games got real tight, like in the fourth quarter. And you know, that's about all you can ask for a championship weekend because we've, uh, you know, last year the Empire just rolled through their two games and and then championship weekend 2022, none of the games were really close. And here we got we got three really compelling games. Uh, and I, I was just all in. I mean, having so much fun out there watching these teams compete. And uh, that's like I said, that's just about all you can ask for when you're getting down to the end of it, just to have some competitive games where the outcome is not really assured until we get to that final buzzer. It was a championship weekend, unlike any other. I mean, you know, you come in with your set of expectations, you scout these teams, you think you have an understanding for what their play styles are, and then some 20 to 30 mile an hour gusts come in and completely wreck 
any notion or intelligence you have in approaching this game, right? I mean, I remember listening to Salt Lake's head coach Bryce Merrill talking on the the studio show about how they've been playing in the stadium for over three seasons now. There has never been a weather event like this besetting that venue in the way that it did this past weekend, where there was there was a kind of wind that just cut through any idea that you knew of what a thrower was capable of, of how they would respond to the elements. I mean, we were talking about it in the pre-show. DC Breeze came into this game as the overall one seed. They led the league in team completion rating, had a rating so high that it would have set an all-time single season record within the UFA. And yet, they looked maybe the most flummoxed of any of the four teams in dealing with the conditions. And that is completely mind-boggling to me. I mean, I was doing sort of uh, uh, note cards for each of these teams. And one of the things that I had at the top for the Breeze was, you know, passer heavy, one of the best throwing teams ever. And then this element comes in and completely redefines what this Breeze team is, right? And, And we'll get into it when we discuss the semifinal, but it's just kind of a microcosm of what the whole weekend was, which was sort of inverting all of your expectations and making all these games into more of a, I don't want to call it a vibes fest or something that <laughs> loose, but it really was almost absent of a kind of strategy. There was just kind of a strap your helmet on and go out there and play sort of dogged mentality to each of these games. I think the biggest separator for Minnesota and the two teams that they faced was a mental preparedness and a mental toughness that like of knowing that things weren't going to go well a lot and just being okay with that. And, you know, we'll get into it as you said, but they were so unaffected by the turnovers and they were so unaffected by the ugliness of the game. Whereas it looked like you could visibly see it on the faces of the Breeze players the, and the Flyers players in those matchups. When, when a mistake was made, it wasn't just, hey, let's move on and keep playing. There was a sense of panic, a sense of, a sense of dread, maybe. <laughs> Um, and a sense of like embarrassment at times that just like would wash over players in these during these mistakes. And, you know, Minnesota had what, 60 turnovers on the weekend. And I don't think more than once or twice did I see like any sign of like visible frustration for any one of them. It was just like, okay, a turnover happened. Uh, it's time to play defense. And, you know, I think that is honestly the biggest reason they came out on top of both games it was just they were they just appeared to be mentally tougher than their opponents they they never broke down they never started blaming each other they never um looked like they wanted to quit in the middle of the game which is not something i can say for their opponents and it 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 shows in the results yeah I mean, Minnesota, you know, they play at Seafoam Stadium. You know this. Everyone in the Central Division knows this. Anyone who goes and plays there knows this. That is an adverse wind venue. And you could just see Minnesota had a completely different mentality than the other three teams and being able to adapt to the the ebbs and flows of what those kind of conditions are like. It was honestly it kind of reminded me a little bit of the first season of the bear when Carmi goes from being in these immaculate kitchens, working with the world's best to being busted down to a sandwich shop, dude, just having to (laughs) pump out 300 orders a day. And it kind of broke him mentally. That's what happened to three of the teams this weekend where they wanted to go out there and play a style of ultimate. They had been cultivating all season and the wind and the wind chill made it certain that they could not, you know, this was, this is also a kind of condition that played in perfectly to what Dylan DeClerc was talking about in, in the press conferences before the semifinals on Friday, which was that this team likes to run downhill at you. They like to, they like to muck up the gaps. They like to play one through seven, no matter what rotation is out there, and they're going to run you. And that was the meta all weekend. It didn't matter if you were a better thrower. It didn't matter if you were, quote unquote, a better team. 
you had to go out there and win every damn point. And, and you could just see that, especially in that, that first semifinal. And maybe this is how we segue into it. Uh, Minnesota versus DC windshield coming out on top 16 to 13, but those first few points, man, I think it was one zero with about six minutes off of the game clock and maybe 15 or 20 combined turnovers. It was unlike any other pro sport game I've seen in this league. Uh, Honestly, I I feel like I got transported back to like 2012 in a rain game or something. (laughs) We were, we were approaching an overall single-game turnovers record at a certain point in the first quarter of D.C. Minnesota. Um, it was still by far and away the most turnovers in a playoff game ever, but it, w- it was just pandemonium. And to your point about Minnesota, they seemed unfazed, even as there was just swirling chaos around them. And in juxtaposition, you have this D.C. team who has looked like the best team in the league over the past month of the season, two months. Uh, they're, they're club champions. They've got multiple world's players on their roster. Like, they're it. And yet, they can't do their tiki-taka, you know, small ball, we connect all the pieces at every point on the field style. And they looked completely undone. I mean, we were talking about it. The body language, the frustration that set in immediately you know, giant throwing up your hands. Where are you throwing it to gestures? Just uh, uh, getting looked off in the lane and like just almost throwing a fit, like completely different from the breeze that we've seen clear through the hardest division in the entire league over the past several weeks. It's just wild too when you looked at the type. So you knew there was going to be throwaways. There were 74 turnovers in this game, which by the way, I was with a group of players, um, like shred players and some other like local, like club players in the stands. And we were taking predictions on how many total turnovers we thought there would be. And even the wildest guess I heard didn't approach 74. I think the highest I heard was maybe 60. Um, The, the types of turnovers though, like you talk about, this is something we talk about like in limited words sometimes in Frisbee about like good turnovers versus bad turnovers. Like a good turnover is, you know, one that's like downfield, like gives you time to set up your defense. It uh, doesn't put you in immediate danger of being scored on. Like you, those are obviously the types of turnovers you prefer to have. And DC, uh, like with some of their throwing choices, like you mentioned, it's almost like they were trying it was almost like they didn't want to adjust. Uh, I, I, this, I could be wrong here, but I, in talking with lots of other people there, um, we, we all kind of got the sense that in these conversations that it was almost like DC went in with a mentality of like, we're just going to run our system. We're going to be okay. Like there wasn't the adjustments just seemed a little late um, and a little bit like not bought in all the way. Like, they would have a couple players who seemed like they wanted to when they were going downwind. Well, let's just take the first open deep look and, you know, we either convert or we put them in a situation where they have to go 80 yards upwind. And then it seemed like other players wanted to just kind of dink and dunk. And there didn't seem to be any consistency with what the game plan was or how they were going to execute it. Whereas Minnesota had a very clear game plan, especially when going upwind. They were, they were, hey, let's get into a position where we can have Josh Klain get the disc with a clean look and just use his raw power as a thrower to just cut through the wind in a way that I don't think really any of the Breeze players can. I mean, this is this kind of looked like in a football game where it's like crappy weather outside and you see like on one side you have like noodle arm Peyton Manning and on the other side you have like Josh Allen who can just power it through any sort of weather. And that's kind of what it felt like in here. You had the finesse throwers of DC who have a million different throws, but don't really have the power to like throw it full field. And then you had the Minnesota throwers where like Josh Klain seems like you could put him in the middle of a a tornado when he would be able to cut through it. And Will Brandt, while not with the power of Josh Klain, certainly can throw it through the wind. And it just looked like AJ Merriman was kind of the only guy who maybe could do that for DC and everyone else was really struggling. 
Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it many, many times. This DC team completely turns away from the deep ball at times. And we've had critiques on that in the past. I feel like they've been pretty far removed from how DC has been playing lately because they're so good on those first two levels of the field. The Mm -hmm. third deep level is kind of irrelevant. You know, when you're completing a league record percentage-wise as a team, you don't need to engage the long ball when you're winning all of these games and doing so through your system. And so I think you can understand their confidence in wanting to rely on what got them here. But to your point, when, you know, discs hit the fan, so to speak, uh, (laughs) they just didn't have anything other than a couple of AJ Merriman to Miles Grovick's deep looks. And that was kind of their ability to play any sort of field position game. I mean, they attempted 15 hooks. They completed four of them. Uh, you know, both teams struggled as far as percentages, but the hucks that DC took felt like complete punts. It didn't even feel like they were really looking for targets. It just felt like they were frustratedly trying to reestablish. Whereas to your point, like Minnesota was four of 20. They weren't any more effective in terms of the raw numbers and results, but if you go back and you watch the film, it felt like they were taking the shots that they still wanted to. Yeah. And like some of those hucks for Minnesota were upwind. Like, I don't know if DC had any upwind throws that approached huck territory. This is true. Um, this that's is true. the other and thing. It, and I think this gets to the strategic adjustment that Minnesota did make, which was, mixing up their lineups so that you would have a thrower or two like a claim and then running them with an otherwise D line rotation. So you Mm -hmm. had a lot of ability to earn the disc back. You maybe had some big, bigger bodies out there. And then you had one thrower to kind of anchor around DC was just running straight O line D line for most of the first half. And the second half, they started to mix things up a bit, put Edmonds onto offense give themselves a little bit more of a downfield throwing presence, but there wasn't a whole bunch of ability for Breeze to mix through their lineups, which I found to be a little surprising. That was not a wrinkle I had anticipated or an advantage for Minnesota was sort of the, the ability to be more dynamic in reorganizing these rotations for the specifics of this matchup. Yeah, and, you know, one thing that was interesting to me was just, like, the way the points were spread out. Kind of like, as you mentioned, like, you know, DC had a number of guys, but they had three players that only played six or less points. Um, And, like, Gus Norbaum, who has been so good for them all year, played only nine points. I mean, he had the fourth fewest points played on the team. Um, It just kind of goes to show you, like, how how adverse the conditions were when you're it seems like you're kind of doing things in a way you haven't done for most of the season um i i didn't understand some of the decision making um and i think if they had to go back and redo it there there would certainly be some things that they would do differently with the lineups and like how they called lines but you know lepler wrote about it in um the honor roll, I think, where he mentioned like, you know, Josh Klain played twice, more than twice as many D points the, this weekend as he did the last two years combined. And if that doesn't tell you like, hey, we're doing a complete strategy adjustment, then I don't know what does. Like that's re- like the perfect stat. I remember at one point in the first semifinal, I forget which broadcaster it was, but they were talking and sarcastically, of course, about the much anticipated matchup of D-line Jeff Wodach versus O-line Dylan DeClerc. <laughs> That's where we were at at a certain point. And it was thrower to Clerk. I think he almost led yeah. the game and assists in this one. No, he had two. He was near the top. Klain and Vandy Martell were, were the leaders in this game. But, you know, it was just it, it, kind of as we set up going into this entire weekend, it was the complete inverse of what we had anticipated. And I think that played out for the, the people on the field as well. Yeah, 100%. And I just think like, DC, even in their losses this year, um, which they only had two, right? They uh, at Salt Lake to start the season and uh, at Boston. 
it they and even in those games that they lost, they their their composure was always there. They completely lost their composure in this game. Uh, the body language was terrible. Like you could see players at times like swarming coach Lauren Boyle. Like they were all trying to like give their opinion at the same time. It looked like they were desperate for some sort of answer for how they were going to like get a foothold back in this game. And if it wasn't for a dropped pole coming out of halftime by Will Brandt that kind of gave DC that double break opportunity that happens when you have an upwind downwind game like this. Uh, I feel like this game honestly just kind of gets out even more out of hand, but that double that, that drop pole to start the third quarter really gave the breeze some life and they were able to tie it up by the end of the third. And that was a big part of that. But once it got to the fourth quarter, I mean, Minnesota really just put this, you know, put their foot down and took control again. And uh, like I said, it, I think so much of it comes down to first off, I, I realize I don't play in other divisions uh, and I've only played certain teams out of division, but you're not going to convince me that there are teams across the league that game plan better than like Minnesota and Madison do for like individual opponents. I think those two teams do such a good job of figuring out ways, especially defensively to like muck up your systems and to apply pressure in ways that are unique. And, uh, you know, I think the coaches, the players certainly deserve a lot of credit, but I think the coaching staff of the Minnesota wind chill, I mean, they, they were just as much a part of this win as anyone was. Oh, I think they were kind of the salient feature of the weekend. I mean, you heard it continually from the players themselves, especially in the post game, how prepared they were, how ready they were for everything. I mean, that is a total extension of head coach Ben Feldman uh, and his assistants, Carlos Lopez and Max Longchamp. I remember what did uh, Feldman had a great turn of phrase in the post game conference. I, I should have written it down. He, he almost said like a beautiful mind as far as what Max Longchamp has done for that team. <laughs> Um, as far as its defensive preparedness and everything else. Um, and you could just see it, right? Like you, you talk about like Minnesota had such a collective calmness in their approach and everyone else was just figuring it out. And we, we should move on from this first semifinal because we still have so much to talk about. Let's talk about the second semifinal, Carolina versus Seattle. Uh, Carolina kind of handled this one from the start. There were a couple of noble charges led by the Cascades as they've done in every single game this season, they do not ever go away quietly. That has been a true, I think, um, accomplishment for this 2024 Cascades team, not only winning the division and making it all the way to the final four in a semifinals appearance for the first time since 2016 for this franchise, but just they have no bad losses this season. You know, like yeah. they, they fell behind pretty considerably in the first half to the Flyers. They could have easily laid down could have easily kind of bowed out of an otherwise Cinderella season. They kept hard charging through that second half. Lucas Ambrose was still flinging himself around like we've never seen in this league before. You know, Mark Munoz makes an incredible layout grab in the end zone. Uh, Spencer Loafing, Zeppelin Ronig, you know, all these up and coming players continue to show that they're ready for the next step, I think. Like I was, I was supremely suppressed with how Seattle fought in that semifinal. And yet, the Flyers just showed that they are, you know, the runner up this season. Like they're a fantastically coached team. They're super talented and they watched that first semifinal and they absolutely understood the assignment because that Carolina yeah. team took 25 huck attempts against Seattle. They only connected on 17, but that is an absolute barrage in the deep space. I mean, that is just bombardment. You could feel it, right? I mean, it's just, Tobias Brooks ripping it to Jacob Fairfax. Alan Laviolette ripping it to uh, Jacob Fairfax. Terrence Mitchell showing off the speed. Like, there's just too much to contain on the Flyers when they get that that twinkle in their eye for the deep ball. Yeah, and you know, the wind died down a ton uh, by the time this game started. Like, they were not playing in nearly the same condition. I mean, even in the first semifinal, by the time we got to the second half, while, while the wind was still, you know definitely affecting things it became a little bit more um realistic to kind of run somewhat of a real offense um but definitely by the time caroline seattle played the wind was there but you know if you play in the central division you play in 
uh, you know, or if you, for us, like we play indoors, but we practice outside. Like we're used to wins kind of like what was going on in Salt Lake. And man, not only did Carolina understand the assignment, I think Seattle kind of missed the assignment uh, in terms of like Carolina is one of the most huck heavy teams in the league and one of the best at it. Um, you know, Seattle's no slouch either. I think uh, they did finish the regular season with the highest completion percentage in the huck game, but Carolina is the team that really likes to throw it. And it felt like there were maybe some missed opportunities to muck up the throwing lanes like like we'll talk about Minnesota doing when we get to talking about their game against Carolina just like more double teaming more like poaching off in like the huck throwing the huck spaces uh because we know the the thing about Seattle as good as they've been defensively with like flying around the field and getting blocks one thing they really lack is size and then you look over at Carolina and they're throwing Drew Swanson at you Henry Fisher Matt Tucker Jacob Fairfax, like these guys that are just giants and can just win discs against pretty much anyone one on one. It feels like. How about Fisher's semifinal game, man? Four and this, three goals, three blocks, winning multiple jump balls over multiple defenders, like just absolutely reasserting himself as big fish. It reminded me so much of his debut weekend in 2019 with the Flyers when he was a rookie. Yeah. I mean. Uh, just a quick rewind for anyone who wasn't quite paying as much attention back then. That 2019 Flyers team was much maligned. Jack Williams had gone to New York for his first season with the Empire. Yep. Jonathan Nethercutt wasn't as integrally involved. Uh, I, I believe they had lost Misha Freistotter as well during the offseason and maybe a couple other pretty notable uh, players. And so there was this sentiment, and I didn't share it at the time, uh, that Carolina would somehow regress, not just like to a lower playoff form, but like out of the South playoffs. But mm-hmm. instead, they get a rookie class with Henry Fisher, Saul Yannick, and Eric Taylor. And they play their first two games in Dallas and Austin. Dallas, of course, being the reigning South Division champions. Henry Fisher went off in those two games. I mean, yep. you could not be contained in deep space. Everyone kept trying to play single matchup coverage on him and he was just turning it into a track meet downfield and that's kind of how it felt a little bit in this game I mean he played one game last year uh was too busy with medical school to get involved you could almost hear in the post-game interview after the semifinal matchup a little bit of uh, a regret in his voice about that it felt like he missed being away from the team and you could really feel him kind of size up in this kind of important matchup that he got to be impactful in this way and right like he got to be big fish again and when he's that way like he is just such a unique and i'm gonna use this word selectively specimen like he's six foot six and runs as fast as anybody on the field it's just hard to account for when that guy starts to go off in addition to all the other players we already mentioned for the flyers having great games you know, Will Brandt was certainly a very deserving MVP. I think you could have made arguments for some other wind chill players as well, like Brian Vinoka. Brian Vinoka is where I want to. That, we'll that's save awesome. that for later. We'll save that for later. Yeah, but let's be real. The best player at championship weekend was Henry Fisher. He was insane. And because and what I love is like it wasn't like just that he was doing it on a turn. It wasn't just that he was doing it with his legs. Even, I mean, this dude was filling up the stat sheet with goals, assists and blocks. He had seven or seven blocks, I believe on the weekend. And in this game, you know, in this first game, he had three, he was plus nine playing, you know, 16 points, 16 points, plus nine, 11 of those were D points. I mean, this guy was everywhere. And it just seems like every time the disc went up in the air, he was either too fast or too big for whoever was trying to go with him. And I was so impressed by just like the confidence he had, because I feel like I remember talking with you about this, but maybe it was a conversation that I had with someone else in 2022 at champ weekend when he was playing offense at the time, he looked in that matchup against New York. I mean, he looked scared. There was a play where 
he went up and Ben Yacht was a full f- like five yards behind him. And he was so scared that Ben Yacht might come get a D that he jumped too early and just let a, a goal sail over his head to nowhere. And it, 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 it seemed like it was just in his head that like there was something going on there. Man, there was none of that this weekend. That dude looked like the most confident dude on the field. I felt like he could have, you could have put any person out there. It didn't matter. He was going to win the matchup. He was going to dominate. And it was just really cool to see that because, like you said, when he first burst onto the scene in the UFA, it was just like, man, this guy is something special. Like, there's just some things he can do that other people aren't going to be able to. And, if you forgot or if you never knew this was the perfect showcase for him to do it on such a large stage with so many eyeballs on it. Uh, And I was just like, really like kind of almost at a loss for words at how well he played the whole weekend. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's truly a game changer when it comes down to it and he's playing like that, but you know, he, he was abetted by a bunch of different great uh, efforts from Carolina. It felt like in that semifinal again, LaViolette, Fairfax, Tobias Brooks, all having pretty stellar games. I know Brooks had five throwaways, but given his kind of playmaking and given that he followed the big Mark Munoz goal with the absolute roof job uh, uh, to the ceiling sky goal, a play later, like, I don't know. His, his ability to give them that that spark plug highlight reel thing while the rest of their veterans can now sort of just play good ultimate. I feel Mm. like that's so much more of a better balance than in the past when they kind of had all these players that are now sort of their core a little bit younger and trying to prove themselves. They just have kind of one singular element like that. But uh, I wanted to continue to move on because we still have so much to get to in this episode. So Carolina wins their semifinal matchup. Minnesota wins theirs. Setting up for Windchill Flyers 2024 UFA Championship game. Feels really anticipated and going into it, it felt like a true toss up. You know, I think everyone was kind of aligned with Carolina clearly has more talent right now. I think in a general, you know, paper tiger sort of way, but given how we had watched the semifinal game suss out, we knew that Minnesota had this sort of environmental edge and coaching edge and experience edge. I think it was one of the things that was kind of failed to be mentioned going into the weekend was that Minnesota was the only team making back-to-back appearances at championship weekend Everyone else was uh, qualifying for the first time in a season or three. Uh, And so I think going into that championship game, I was of the mindset that it was going to be real 50-50. Minnesota removed any kind of doubt about that within, you know, I don't know, two minutes of game clock going on. (laughs) Yeah, It was just a cascading series of errors, self-inflicted wounds for the Flyers on their opening handful of offensive possessions and given how Minnesota was just playing so confidently and playing true team ball they were just running it down their throats I mean again I mentioned at the top of this episode they they went up I think 4-0 they had an opportunity to go up 6-1 failed to convert on an attempt in the end zone right on the goal line uh and ended up uh, right at the beginning of the second quarter, being up 8-2 in this game. I mean, it looked all but over within the first, you know, 14 minutes of game clock going by. Yeah, I mean, Carolina dropped the disc on th- their first four possessions of the game. And outside of the second one, which was, a like, still very catchable, but, like, clearly a high throw, the other three, I mean, they were right in the breadbasket. I mean, there was, it wasn't like, You know, a lot of people who maybe didn't watch the whole game or maybe didn't think about how things happened early on might think, well, it was just that wind, but it really wasn't. These were like crisp throws right in the gut. And I mean, Carolina just came out and I mean, they had the yips. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. They, they couldn't catch just normal discs right into their, right into their gut. And Minnesota capitalized so quickly on those first four points too. Like you said, within two minutes of game clock. They're up four to zero and, you know, by halftime, they're up 12 to six. And it was just, while I thought kind of this along the same lines as you, I I think maybe I had a slight edge to Carolina, especially because 
while there was some wind, especially at the beginning of the game, it was nothing terrible. Um, it was just crazy how seemingly just not ready to play Frisbee they were at the beginning of the game. And even throughout the second quarter, I mean, it was, it was pretty tangible kind of like, it was in the breeze, uh, Minnesota wind chill final, where Minnesota was just more ready to go right off the bat and playing with a lot more confidence. And you just kind of saw it wearing on Carolina as well. Like you, you could see the frustration coming through on those throughout the whole first half with the just some of the simple mistakes that were being made. And yet, and yet, because it's Minnesota sports, <laughs> nothing good can come to pass. Nope. From- front to back of any game of professional men's athletics in that state. And so, yep, Minnesota first three quarters, absolutely crushing. They take a 15 to 11 lead into the final frame of the entire season. And Carolina rips off four in a row to start the fourth quarter. They tie it up at 15s. Just one of the more, I I didn't even have time behind the scenes to cut any highlights. It was happening so quickly. Right. And it's at such a heightened drama point of the season that I'm literally fighting my conscious brain between my work and having to watch one of the most historical collapses happening in real time. Right. Like yeah. it's this split of like, OK, I got to show how they that Carolina's been back within two. And then it's like watching the other two goals disappear the two goal lead that Minnesota had disappear as I'm like cutting something like it was it was such a quick and precipitous turn of events that I'm still kind of amazed that Minnesota made it out with a W like it really again reinforces the idea of how mentally tough this wind chill team was going into this weekend because what other team could sustain a, a four goal run by the opponent in that scenario right yeah and not and not lose like i I, they they, you know they 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 hemorrhage away those four goals and then they come back onto the field and they get a pretty calm full field drive to retake the lead that they won't relinquish again yeah and and then and then they break to go up too i mean they they just even in in both games, actually. So in the third quarter of their semifinal, they they go in with a four goal lead to halftime, and that mm-hmm. four goal lead is gone almost immediately, much like it was in the fourth quarter of this game. And in both situations, they just respond by calmly going down and scoring, and then reasserting that they're the better team that day. And it's something that I think you talked about their experience in terms of like being at championship weekend last year, but let's just talk about their experience in general. Like they have guys that have played in this league. Some of them like Brandon Mattis for more than a decade. You have Vinoka, who I think was in his ninth season, Josh Klain, who's been Klain around in his hundredth for- career game in the championship. How yeah. about that? I mean, and, You have guys like that that just have so much experience in this league, so much experience with games, you know, where you feel like you're safe and then a team comes back and you have to reassert like that you, you know, can win the game. They were three and three at home this year. Yeah, I think it just showed up when it needed to, you know, it showed up at the right time. Like Carolina definitely has some veterans, right? They have a lot of guys who have been there before, done that. But it didn't seem, you know, I, I I just go back to like those types of mistakes they made early in the game. Those are mental errors, right? Like catching a disc that's right in your gut's a mental error. And Minnesota just limited theirs. You know, Minnesota had one drop in this game to Carolina six, right? Like things like that, the, the things that you can control, kind of like the mental stuff that you can mostly control. It just seemed like Minnesota controlled those things better throughout the weekend. Um Carolina had to expend a bunch of energy to come back. And I think this is something kind of a trend I feel like I've seen throughout the season is that a lot of teams that have gotten into big holes this year, it's it, they've been able to come back and get back into the game, but it's really hard when you expend so much energy fighting back to then also kind of like reach, like reach back for just a little bit more to then take the lead. I feel like so often this year, 
I, I see a team come back, but then it's just like they're gassed from that. Like they don't have what it, they don't have anything left at that point to then push to actually stay in the game after that. And I think that's kind of what we saw in both Minnesota games where the teams fought back and then they just didn't have quite enough left in the tank to push through and actually take the lead and keep it. So, um, you know, that this Minnesota needed to get the big lead, but they also said like in the post game, you know, we knew that, you know, the other team's going to make a run at some point and that we're going to have to withstand that. And when you go into a game knowing that like, hey, some there's going to be times where things aren't going to go our way. And you know what? That's OK, because we can, you know, regain our traction and then get things going in our direction again. Um, and it just I don't know that with the way that they were mucking up Carolina's offense, especially early, even without the drops, they were just kind of like in throwing lanes and clearly tr- making an effort to keep Carolina from being a successful in the Huck game. You want to hear this number? They were 18, what was it? 17 of 25 in the semifinal. They were, Carolina was seven of 20 against Minnesota in the deep game. And the conditions were not the reason for that. The conditions were largely the same they were in that Seattle game, I think, in terms of wind, maybe even calmer towards the end. And they were wildly less successful. You know, they completed Hucks at about basically half the rate that they did. So let's break that down just a little bit, because I think it's the interesting discrepancy between West division defenses and the central, right? You know, Seattle, Seattle rated as one of the best defenses in the league this year. They were tied with Madison for breaks per game. A number of uh, weeks. They, they were near the top in defensive efficiency. They were near the top in break rate. And yet against Carolina, we've been talking about this. They struggled to contain that deep game, and it's been the Achilles heel of this Cascades defense the past few weeks. You know, in their their first round playoff game against Oakland, they allowed the Spiders to connect on 13 of 15 deep shots, 87%. They had some trouble against Colorado and other teams this season. Um, and that's because when you watch this Cascades team play defense, it's all man up. It's all one-on-one coverage. They don't they don't fluster throwers. They don't throw a trap double team or put a straight up mark and say no hook. They trust their athletes to go make a play, right? And and to their credit, they won a division title doing that. It's just that there's levels to this. And when you go and play these other teams from different divisions with different strategies, they're going to know how to stretch the field a little bit more. This Carolina team is kind of the exemplar of balance stretch the field and go deep attack i mean salt lake has based a lot of their precepts off of the flyers bryce merrill has talked about cribbing from denardis offensive strategies you know like this carolina team is kind of the premier and and they showed that against cascades they stretched them out they got single targets downfield and then they just threw it out into space for them to go get against minnesota you see these hucks go up from carolina they're flattening out they're, they're tailing off before they get to the target. So it's an easy swat down for Brandon Mattis on Henry Fisher, you know, in the under space. It's not reaching the intended target. That's not because Carolina's throwers are suddenly bad the second night. It's because Minnesota is getting in the way of so many of those discs. They're not allowing Carolina to get into power position. They're trapping Alan LaViolette. They're, they're making them throw off the back foot, you know, late yep. stall. The, the You talked about the break score that was the game-clinching goal. They get a turn on a coverage sack in the red zone on yeah. Carolina. That was diabolical, man. That was one of my favorite moments of the entire season. Just seeing absolute bend, not break, goal line pressure defense just shut down one of the top three offenses in the league. Like, that's what Minnesota does. This is what has been their calling card. It's what made me a little bit skeptical of them in the back half of the season when so much of their identity was around kind of some of the things their offense was doing while their defense seemed to have struggles with generating pressure and converting breaks that didn't apply this weekend, right? Like they had the absolute know-how how how to get into these teams heads and basically make the wind an eighth defender for them. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned getting in the way of the Hucks. There were several times throughout this game where, Carolina would connect to like an Anders Jungst or somebody at kind of, you know, 10, 15 yards downfield. And there would be somebody streaking downfield 
seemingly open for a huck, but then all of a sudden, you know, you're being just completely harassed by two defenders and there's just no throwing lane. And it's like, I've experienced this so many times playing in India and playing against this windchill team where I'm streaking deep. I've beat my guy and it just doesn't matter because there's just no way to get the disc to me. And it's incredibly frustrating because, you know, the right thing to do in that moment is to not try to force the huck. But at the same time, you feel like you've worked so hard to get open and that you've created separation and there's just no way to get the disc there. And that is an adjustment. You know, that's something that they just do so well. And especially against a team like Carolina that really does want to stretch the field um, as much as possible. They weren't able to do that. And you saw some of the Hucks go up kind of, I think, out of pure frustration and just wanting to throw it deep. And there would be double coverage. And you're just kind of left scratching your head with why they threw it in the first place. A couple of their nice Hucks, I think both of these that I'm thinking of are actually both from Tobias Harris uh, to... um, Oh, who was he to Terrence Mitchell? And they were great throws. And you saw in both of those situations, what happened is he was able to get in under and create enough separation from his defender that when he caught it, he had time to step out and throw a big backhand before the double team or before the poach in the lane was able to get there. And that's kind of how you have to win in the Huck game against this team is to be able to create that separation by enough space that you do have time to catch and turn and throw. And outside of that, like everything else was just, was just really hard uh, for, for men or sorry, for Carolina. And another thing they had to do this without Brett Bergmeier, who I think is, you know, a really underrated player in this league and a guy that does so much for them, not only as a defender and another big guy, but also he's really stepped into kind of a, a, a lead leader in the counterattack as well as a guy with that touches the disc a lot. And, you know, he sustained a shoulder injury in that first round game and they had to pivot and obviously substitute in for him. And, you know, even without that guy, they were still able to just put on an absolute defensive masterclass. Yeah. And once again, congratulations to the entire Winchell organization. Uh, Special congratulations to Will Brandt. He wins championship weekend MVP for his fantastic performance, especially in the championship game. It felt like he was just walking the Minnesota uh, offense down the field at certain points, especially in the second half. He was so instrumental in keeping those drives alive and just shredding Ben Snell on the mark. Ben Snell is such a good defender. I mean, he was a central reason why the Atlanta Hustle are not representing the South Division at championship weekend. You know, he (laughs) played keep away and called game famously at the end of that uh, South Division uh, matchup. But Against Will Brandt, you know, Snell's a long defender. He had no answers for that step-out flick and that big around backhand that Brandt uses to absolutely nullify defenses and continue to stretch the field horizontally for the Minnesota offense and give them more attack angles. Will Brandt's cheat code, man. I I think the the first time we really talked about it this year – it, Colorado. It was after the Colorado game where yep. he same thing. He, he had Kai Marshall on him, six foot five. Did not matter. Yeah, and it's just like, you know, uh, what do you do? I mean, the dude's long, long as all get out, and not only that, but he uses these release points that are like pretty far away from his body, and it's just like you really can't take everything away from him. You do kind of have to pick and choose, like all right, do I want to force him to throw the around flick or do I want to force him to throw the inside backhand? Because you can't take away both. And um, that's just put so much pressure on your defense to know that when that guy has the disc, the whole field's just kind of available to him. Um, it, you, But like you still obviously need to like, you know, execute your game plan at that moment, which is probably, you know, a force one way or the other. And you just got to be prepared for it. I mean, the the best thing you can do is try to just keep him from getting the disc. But then, then it's like, how do you do that? You can just kind of put something out to space, and he's so lanky that you can. You're probably not going to be able to to keep him from getting it. So, well, and he, he does such a good job. 
I, I, sorry, not to interrupt too. No, long, you're good. Go. I, I I just wanted to say like one of the things that I really appreciate about the evolution of his game is that he's kind of becoming a little bit what Johnny Malks has over the past few seasons, which is not some type of wide receiver one downfield, but he's active enough to keep defenders honest. And if you back him, he will have no problem stretching you downfield mm-hmm. as he did. Brant, this is uh, on the go ahead goal in the fourth quarter, you know, like John Wellers got a little bit over aggressive on an undercut and Brant just took an easy fade and got an easy pass from Vanuka. And that was kind of the game from that point. It just, Brant always has this feel for games where he understands what he needs to be in any given moment. 90% of the time it's as a QB one thrower, but his ability to to sort of break out of that role and understand that he can still be a viable receiver has just expanded his game immensely the past two years. Yeah, and also shout out to John Weathers, Wellers because he, he had an awesome game in the championship game. Um, oh, those Carolina rookie defenders, him and Belis. Whew. Yeah, like Wellers not only had a couple of massive Ds, he also had pulled in a couple of the hucks that were completed. Um, just like just destroying people downfield on a turnover. And uh, I thought he was a pretty standout player for Carolina in, in the finals, uh, along with Henry Fisher, just continuing, as I mentioned earlier, like if Carolina wins the title, there's, it's a no doubter. Like we talked about, there's like numerous people I think you could have selected for Minnesota. Like it could have been Vinoka. It could have even been Clayne. Like, I feel like there's a number of guys who are just so instrumental to what they did this weekend. If Carolina won, it was it was going to one place, and I don't think anyone would have thought twice about where it was going. Like Henry Fisher was unreal this weekend, and I think as far as like the best individual player and just kind of game breaking certain situations, it was him. And like with Will Brandt, the stat line in terms of scores and all that isn't super impressive, but when you 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 are one hundred percent right, like he can just walk them down the field and just is such a calming presence in that backfield that like, that's why he won the MVP It was just the effect he had on how the entire offense was being run. And it is kind of cool in a situation like this, when the person that wins MVP, they didn't just go check the stats and see like who had the best plus minus. Like it, it was clear that it was thought about like who actually had the greatest effect on a game. And from that perspective, I think Will Brandt 100% deserved the MVP. I, uh, and you can make an argument for other people, but I don't think you can make an argument against him and by any means. I won't make an argument against him because I do agree Brandt deserves all the praise and flowers that we've been throwing his way, but I will make an argument for somebody else. And that person is Brian Vanuka. And it's it's not only the sense of he's the captain of this team, he's been the captain of this team, he had a phenomenal weekend, he split his playing points 50-50 between offense and defense in both games, right? Mm-hmm. Like we've talked about the rotational versatility and the coaching staff's ability to kind of plug and play. Brian Vanuka is the 1A reason why you can do that. And he has been so good the past two to three seasons, especially in being a mainline offensive star, but taking these particular assignments that Feldman and the rest of the coaching staff will throw him for D line spot starts and playing it like he's a normal defensive starter. I mean, you talk about a guy who you could put into any role and any point on any given game and he would succeed. It's B Vaughn. And, and I'll just tell you even personally, man, I've trained with some people in this league. B Vaughn is it. He'll do it with a smile too, man. He is a polite killer, but he is ruthless in his work ethic and his application of being a leader on this team. And I think he really saw it this weekend. I mean, that championship game, three assists, one goal, one block, 19 of 19 from the field, plus five, over 400 total yards, four hockey assists. Again, this is while splitting time between offense and defense. Well, the only players all weekend to play in over 20 points in a given game too. absolute mm-hmm. workhorse scored the game winning goal, getting on a uh, open cut to the front cone looked like he could have played two more quarters after that. I mean, I don't know. It's just one of those things where when we talk about 
how we evaluate talent in this league, Bivon is one of those guys who I feel like we continually overlook because what else do you need from a star than what he gave the wind chill this past weekend? I mean, they needed him to do exactly what he did and he did it with a plum. A little homework assignment for all you out there. Go look up how Bivon's numbers in playoff games, just in general. I, I was talking to James Pollard and Alex Atkins and, you know, the rest of the crew down in the corner as we were watching the game at cer- certain points. I said, that's big game Bivon. Like in big games, Bivon doesn't miss. Like he just, he's the best, pl- it, like in so many cases, like just seems to be the best player in the field. Like go back to his performance against Salt Lake at championship weekend last year. And he just had some of the biggest grabs of the entire, of that game. Like we remember the Joel Clutton, you know, buzzer beating, uh, you know, hand of God, basically, that t- tied the game as he taps it to Elijah Jaime. But if you go back and watch the highlights from that game, it's big, you know, big grab from Bivon, big throw from Bivon. Like in the DC game, in the semifinal, when DC, you know, was had kind of reclaimed a little bit of control and it looked like it was a game again, it was a big grab from Bivon on an upwind point uh, leading to a score, I want to say one or two throws later, that really felt like it sealed the game for Minnesota. And it was a grab that he had no business making, right? It was just like he kind of had to like go around a DC defender to even get to the disc while he was like going to get it. And all of a sudden, of course, it's in his hand because again, he's big game Bivon and that's what he does. And he just kind of seems inevitable in these big games. You know, he's going to play as well as anyone and he's going to kind of ratchet up to another level uh, that we see occasionally during the regular season, but seems to always be there when things are really on the line. I've got to check your recency bias on this one, bro. I'm sorry. Like I love Bivon, man, but his turn up in big games is a relatively recent phenomenon. You go is back it just to- the last few seasons that it's happened. Yeah. He, I mean, he's had some pretty bad performances in playoff elimination games in 2021. He had five throwaways against Chicago 2022. He had four throwaways like, Oh, that 2022 game was, uh, I forgot about that game. That was one of the ugliest, uh, like this game's over by the end of the like by the middle of the second quarter games i i totally spaced that one the whole the whole uh wind chill team kind of fell apart in front of our very eyes in that one i totally yep, forgot yep. no it, it's it it's again it, it's the last two years though he has been incredible like he was really good against us last year in the yeah, division totally. championship and amazing in the uh he was amazing in the salt lake game I think it's emblematic of where Minnesota has come as a franchise. I mean, before last year, they hadn't won a playoff game ever, you know? Uh, uh, no, uh, 2022, they beat us in the first round. But I, I get Oh, you. sorry. Yeah, yeah, They did beat you in the first round. They had one playoff win in like seven playoff appearances as a franchise. Yeah, and they, they had the 2021 division title game all but locked up. Bef- but to, to what you mentioned earlier... Minnesota sports, just especially the men's professional Minnesota sports, you just can't ever think that anything good's going to happen to you because that 2021 title game against Chicago is the perfect example of, you know, snatching uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Chicago closed that game on a four goal run, five goal run, had the the immaculate out of nowhere Nate Goff block on a J- Josh Klain hook. They had blown coverage. Chicago had blown coverage downfield. There was just a wide open receiver. Klain was just going to boost it into the end zone. And Nate Goff, like, eclipsed the sun, essentially, in the lane (laughs) to get the block. Just phenomenal. I mean, but, again, getting back to Minnesota's successes, I mean, this is a team that has endured a lot over the years. This is a team who has come off of gut-wrenching defeat after gut-wrenching defeat in the playoffs. You know, they got stomach-punched at home last year. That has been fueling this team for you know 12 plus months at this point and I think it really goes to show how much you can buck a trend how much you don't your story is not decided until you kind of put down the pen because Brian Vanuka has just continued to grind into his mid-30s and is playing still the best ultimate of his career it seems kind of one of those cases where when is he going to slow down alongside like a Travis Dunn or I don't know, a Cameron Brock, 
Uh, Who's that guy? That yeah, guy I don't sucks. know. Uh, man, you know what? Like, I feel like we're kind of at the moment in the podcast, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it too. Just like kind of a retrospective on this Minnesota team, like to kind of move on to past this individual game. You know, I think this team clearly was doubted going into this weekend, and this was a really unusual season for them. Uh, Their home dominance completely went away. They had a 500 record at home during the regular season. They didn't lose a game there last year. Huh? I was just adding to it. They didn't lose a game there last year. Uh, They lost one, uh, the um, Chicago game. Sorry, yes, they lost Which was an anomaly because Chicago was not great last year, but just seems like they kind of find a way to get one up in Minnesota every year. But they also had these wild like roster inconsistency that really for the last few seasons, they haven't really had that. And between injuries and just, you know, worlds and people just having to miss random weeks of the season, you know, we saw that stretch where their defense really kind of looked like it had lost its ability to force turnovers. But when you go back and look, I mean, they're missing a Dylan DeClerc here, a Brett Bergmeier there, a Sam Berglund over there. And they just couldn't quite get all their pieces on the field together. But then at the end of the season, you know, they finally get everyone together and they just kind of pick up where they left off, where they just seem to be an absolute menace defensively. They come out with game plans that are, you know, perfectly tailored to their opponent and stopping the things they want to do. And it just really is just like the maturation process of this team as well. Like they have so many guys that have been there for so long. Like it's hard for me to remember a wind chill team without a Dylan DeClerc. Although I know I played against a wind chill team without him and without Bivon and a guy like Will Brandt that we have really just like seen grow up in front of us and mature as a player over the last few seasons. They mixed in so many guys that, had either not played before or had not played big roles before this year, like a Silval Fernandez, a Gordon Larson, adding a guy like Noah Hansen. Like uh, they just, you know, this was a team that like won as a team. Like they weren't being necessarily carried by an individual. It, it's we're so used to recently teams like the New York empire. And while we praised their entire team, there were certainly you know, four to six names that always kind of seem to be top of mind and seem to be putting up all the numbers. And, you know, when you look at this Minnesota team, it's just very rarely that it's usually just so well spread out. And to to your point about what Dylan DeClerc said, it's guy one to guy seven on the point. It's never about just guy one and two. It it just kind of seems like every piece fits in and they can kind of interchange whenever they want and it's and it'll just work out so a couple of final notes on minnesota's winning weekend all eight of minnesota's top eight um most games played players in their franchise's history were on this roster six of them were active this weekend only michael jordan and james kittleson did not play but the other six brandon mattis josh clayne dylan DeClerc, brian vanuka colin berry and jordan taylor were all instrumental in the team's two wins uh again kittleson and michael jordan are both in the top eight for games played in windchill franchise history but did not make game appearances uh at championship weekend but to your points throughout this episode there is just a, a masthead of veteran core presence who has been here throughout the continuity of this team's existence uh that really informs the kind of come up that is happening for them Uh, This is the first Central Division team to win a UFA title since 2018 Madison. And you were mentioning a second ago, kind of in comparison with New York, how many titles have been defined sort of by talent in recent seasons. And it was a point that actually Bryce Merrill had made in one of the the studio show segments of, you know, this, this Minnesota team, despite, you know, the obvious associations of being a divisional rival with Madison, just reminded him so much of that team in the sense of, Madison wasn't favored in that bracket either. They were maligned for being less talented, and yet 
they came out the true victors by a pretty decided margin in the 2018 bracket. Very similar to Minnesota. They're just, there wasn't a singular thing you could point to. And yet because of the overwhelming team success, they just kind of rolled up on people. Uh, the 60 combined turnovers that Minnesota had in their <laughs> semifinal and final games, uh, obvious new UFA championship high for a winning team. I went back and calculated all the teams since 2014, their uh, championship turnover woes. The second highest was 42, which the Spiders had in both 2014 and 2015. So Minnesota set the new record by a whopping 18 turnovers. New York had the low in 2022. They had just 19 total turnovers against Carolina and Chicago that season. Just phenomenal. And again, less than a third of the total turnovers that Minnesota had this weekend to show you the kind of disparity and variance between those two events. Yeah. Can I, I want to put something to rest. I get, I get that people have doubted this Minnesota team and I understand why. And look, I, I think I've been open with people that I at least talked to about this, but like I did not pick them to win either game. But that was not to say that I didn't think they couldn't win either game. Like, I thought both games were going to be close, and I favored DC. Literally, I thought it might it was going to be a one-goal game. And I favored Carolina. Again, I thought maybe a one-goal game. Like, I have a lot of respect for this Minnesota team, and I, I just couldn't believe... I guess maybe it's just the nature of me... Like when you play against the team as much, it's like, you know, you kind of know ball, right? Like, you know, you know what's out there and you know how good they really are because you've seen it up close. And I, I thought they had a great chance to win both games. Like, and to hear some people be like, oh, well, you know, it's just the wind. Well, why are people acting like the wind only existed for them? Like for the other team, like the wind was only turned on when, you know, Carolina had the disc oh, or when DC these are had just the disc? detractors. These are the same people who said we should have implemented new rules because Carolina was one of two teams this entire season. <laughs> with and clock. It's the same people asking us to do it indoors because there was win adverse wind conditions for two games ever at a stadium that normally doesn't experience yeah. this kind of conditions. Like these are just reactionaries, right? Like, I don't know what to some do. Some of them. Some of them some were of players. Them. I mean, you know, this is like... Oh, players can be the most reactional, reactionary. That's, that's fair. That's Come fair. on. I guess what I was getting to is it wasn't <laughs> just fans, but you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, By the way, every Utahan out there made sure to let me know that this was not normal wind. It was really funny. Like, it was almost like every every person I met that was native to Utah, like, that's, felt that they needed to assure me that this was not normal. That is so Midwestern coded about somehow, like, being a little ashamed of the weather as you're, like, hosting somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so cold here. Like, that's where you get in Minnesota or something. Like, Oh, yeah, really, it did kind of really feel like that. But, yeah, I mean, I think people, and this isn't, like, a lot of people don't respect Minnesota, I think, because some of their games tend to be a little sloppier. But you mentioned, like, they play in maybe, like, one of the most consistently, like, wind-adverse stadiums. Not just because it's windy, but also it can get a little swirly. And I know they're not the only team that has a stadium like that. Like, uh, I think um, Oakland's stadium is kind of like that, too. But, oh, yeah. Um, Texas, and I talked- any of the Texas teams, when you get yeah. that Texas wind going, whoo. So I get it, but like, you know, I think it do, it does give them a mental toughness, like having to deal with that all the time that other teams just aren't used to, you know, and I, I think that was on full display and, you know, people are going to continue to think like, oh, if it was just better weather, if they were playing here or playing there, that like the, the results would have been different and maybe they would have been and maybe they wouldn't. But uh, t- to think that like Minnesota wasn't capable or that they aren't like a deserving champion because of that. I think that's just people being salty because they thought DC was going to win um, or people being salty because they thought Carolina was going to win or whatever. But I think, I think it was on full display, like especially in that second in the championship game where the wind was there, but it wasn't anything that like 
people couldn't throw in. And especially with the delay to the start time, I, I think that even helped even more with the wind kind of lessening. And it was just like, I'm sorry, if you can't go out and throw in that, then like you don't have a, any reason to call yourself uh, a team that should have won a championship. And so I just think, you know, to all the haters out there, I know y'all going to continue to hate. That's cool, I guess. But like this team's deserving. Like they, they went out and took it and – you know, there were three other teams that could have gone out there this weekend and taken it, but only one team did. So congrats to Minnesota. Like, you know, me, Brandon Mattis and I, we've had a, a kind of a special, like real friendly relationship over the past, gosh, like six, seven years now. And, you know, I know how hard he's worked and I talk to him all the time in the off season. We're always chattering about what's happening. And, you know, it was, I got to say one of the most special moments I've been able to witness. Um, and you know, in 12 years in this league was seeing him just embrace his wife and embrace his parents and just like all the tears streaming. I mean, I started crying, just watching him, like all the emotions flood out of him. And, it was just like one of the most wholesome moments that uh, I could like ever imagine. I mean, he was, he's been here since day one of the franchise, the only player Mm -hmm. to have been on board since the beginning day of the wind chill. And he was essentially the final roster ad when he was on that team, you know, Mm -hmm. he came out of lesser known programs, went to Wichita state after transferring from St. Mary's, I believe, uh, in uh minnesota very small school uh so yeah man i mean i i've known brandon for going on close to a decade now and he's the hardest working nicest person we have in this league and couldn't happen to a better guy again all those eight kind of integral minnesota players that i mentioned a a moment ago as well another notable person who just won their first professional title matt raider you yeah. know, and and another one of those pieces that I don't know that he quite had the visible impact that maybe we were expecting from. But you go back and you note all of the plays that he made that were kind of fire starter moments. And he had one in the semifinals game. Minnesota yep. had a pretty bad turnover at a pretty bad moment of the game where they were almost going to yield a DC break right into the end zone and Raider got a huge layout block on the goal line in order to, in order to preserve Minnesota possession. Um, But, you know, he, he didn't have some outsized impact on Minnesota successes. And yet I can tell you his presence was absolutely fueling this championship run, you know, to just have a guy like that, be able to show up, play a cog part, play his role, go out there, hustle. I mean, I can tell you from talking with windchill players, they were all wanting autographs from that man when he showed up day one. <laughs> First and foremost, Brandon Mattis. He was fanboying hard when Raiders signed with them. Uh, and it just added something, right? Like, it's it's a real testament to, to Feldman as a GM, too. Like, they just added all of these right pieces. They re-signed the right players. And Noah Hansen and Gordon Larson, who really elevated their games this year. Like, it was just, again, total construction of a championship team. Yeah, and Matt Raider, that D he got, it was his turnover. I mean, he had I think a lot that, of them in the semifinals. He was five of ten on throws, but he sure. had four blocks. So, yeah, I think that's like kind of the whole point, though, right? Like so many other teams, like it, every turnover was like it was like somebody took their like stole their puppy from them right in front of their eyes, and they just couldn't recover. I mean, one of the things that was really frustrating watching DC was it looked like there was a complete lack of like focus and effort to get back on defense at times after a turnover and there Matt Raider throws a turnover and then he's immediately laying out to get a block. I mean, it's just like, there was really almost no time at all for him to like recover from that mistake. And you could just like that. I, that's the difference right there. That, that play probably better than any play throughout the whole week and exemplifies exactly why Minnesota is the champions is because in the face of adversity, it was immediately, well, let's go get it back. And there was no wasted time or wasted effort worrying about things that at that point you can't control anymore, which is the fact, oh, we don't have the disc. So now we got to go get it back. And that that might be just like that few seconds clip. Like that, that could be just like the album cover for this, you know, 
co- concert they put on throughout the weekend. All right, so we'll end on this, and without getting too far ahead of ourselves, is Minnesota the favorite going into 2025 or who you got <laughs> going into next year? And no, you can't pick your own team. Uh, well... Aren't we all like kind of free agents at this point? Uh, we don't sign multi-year contracts. I, I want to see, by the way, what's the longest contract that's been signed in the league? Isn't it like five years? It's Pavel. Pavel's Pavel, 6 year one with LA has got to be the longest. Yeah. Um, I would say it's hard to say. And oh. No, no, no. No, it's hard to say with Minnesota specifically because we mentioned so many guys that have played for so long and after finally finally accomplishing this there is that question that i'm sure is on a lot of people's minds like are some of these guys done now you know like i i think that's a real fair question to ask i know um i i'm not gonna out anyone is like not coming back but i do know in some conversations i've had i had like at championship weekend like even before that they won the championship that there is definitely was already some real potential for some players to like maybe not come back. Um, I'll let those players, you know, speak to that themselves in the coming weeks and months as they make their decisions and figure out what they want to do. But I think when you have as many guys as they do with the experience that they have, it would not be unrealistic for to think that some of those guys might step down. And I think for that reason alone, I would not say that they're the favorites for next year because I think there's just too many question marks on that roster um, I think the teams that I would kind of favor going into next year, I, I mean, I think DC definitely is still going to be around. I think Carolina is still going to be around. By the way, uh, Evan Lepler mentioned that Mike Denardis will most likely not be returning as a head coach. He will still be absolutely involved with the organization as an owner, and I'm sure he'll show yeah. up to some practices. But Lepler was reporting this weekend that that may have been – the, the final concert, as you were saying, for one of the league's all-time great coaches, 2021 champion and coach of the year that year. I will say, uh, I, his wife was there. Talk, uh, I was sitting with Steven Naji, uh, Austin, and uh, Ryan Purcell, you know, Austin Soul dudes. And um, they asked her about it. And she said, I'll believe it when he's not there, when he doesn't start, you know, showing up to practices next year. Totally. So, I mean, it's like that with all of you guys. I mean, you are retired. No one can get you all away from this. We're, we're total addicts. We're you know, sick sure. in the head, man. We, we are, we are. Um, but yeah, like, I think, you know, you look at the, I think Carolina and DC probably are the first two teams that come to mind, right? Like they, they have um, a lot of guys who seem to still have a lot in the tank. Um, Atlanta is sobbing right now. Yeah, like Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta is like they are down Bobby Lay and uh, Matt Smith, it looks like, going into next year. And those are two pretty big hits for their offense. So, like, I'm not really going there. A team, you know, a team I'm really interested in, uh, if they can stay healthy. And like get people there. I'm still like really intrigued by Colorado as a team, but I think I have to go with like, I think I got to go with DC. Like, I just think they have, they were the favorite coming into championship weekend for a reason. They were playing unreal ultimate towards the end of the season. And even through their first playoff game, um, they clearly had a really bad showing. And I think in particular, there were some individual players that just played absolutely horrendously bad in that semifinal from a decision making and execution whatever standpoint but i do think they still have so much talent they have so many pieces that i assume are going to keep coming around because they're not like to that point where you think they're going to be aging out um and uh yeah i think they're definitely like them in carolina really are top of my head and they were at championship at weekend this year for a reason and uh i i I think that that trend will probably continue into next year, but I don't know. We'll have to see what the off season brings. We all thought New York was going to be winning next year oh, until, I, uh, my you point, know, a crazy off season. My point was going to be, if we rewound the tape going back <laughs> to the beginning of April, just three weeks away from game starting the reigning champions, losing two MVPs off their roster and setting up this absolutely tumultuous season that has been such a thrill to follow the entire way. 
Yeah. You know what would be an inter- an interesting uh, podcast would be uh, if we went back through and kind of thought about some of our takes earlier in the season and how right and how wrong we were on some of those. Oh, be no. A- well, we need to go and do, and Daniel didn't, Daniel and I did an episode of this is go back and flip a few results and say what would happen if this <laughs> game this it's all one goal games it all has to be one goal games but you just flip the result the other way and try to think through what the what the consequences and butterfly effects of that would be that would be that'd be interesting and I think especially I mean the with- Boston games alone become yeah. very very interesting Boston is one of the teams that I think you, that you're sort of remiss from not mentioning just because if Babbitt goes back there again year two having a full off season to build into that program think of what they could do but I hear you DC is still at the top of that division New York I don't think is going anywhere I think they just experienced such a shell shock that they were sort of dealing with two different uh, fronts of battle that they had to contend with both you know sort of the emotional internal landscape and then everyone's still coming with the giant target on their back that they've been setting up the past several seasons. So I I still like the empire going into 2025. I don't know. I agree with you though. I think Carolina and DC at the top of the head, but Hey man, Minnesota's listening to this podcast. Absolutely. And I bet they're using this as whiteboard material too, because everyone doubted them this year. They were the four seed and they got it done. They're the ones hoisting the trophy. Yeah. And deservedly. So I, uh, my it, it literally my only hesitation with them is I need to see that all these guys are coming back. If they bring back, you know, ninety percent of their roster, yeah, I mean, they have as good a chance as anyone is running it back. I, I think they've been the class of the Central Division for the last two years, and it hasn't really been close. So it seems like they kind of have a stranglehold there, and they need to until someone can knock them off and. You know, they they really outclassed uh, everyone this year. I felt like when they actually had their roster there. So I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see, though. I'm excited because, you know, we haven't had a lot of explosive off seasons uh, necessarily. And while two years ago, certainly I wouldn't necessarily call it explosive. There was definitely some interesting things happening with like Pavel going to L.A. being the, probably the most notable. And then this past off season being the wildest of the off seasons like in probably in any season just with what happened with the with new york just a month before we were playing games so yeah i mean i i'm excited we you know this is like the first season i'm going into the off season feeling like i need to almost watch free agency like you would for like the nfl or nba to see where people end up and um what's going to happen because even like a lucas ambrose move this year was huge and we saw how important and how great he was for Seattle and like ramping up that defense and giving them, uh, I mean, he's a huge reason that they made the championship weekend. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm just excited for what comes once free agency really hits, if we want to call it that, which, uh, what October 1st, I believe is when that is official, officially open season. I think so, but we usually don't start getting that kind of news and notification until a little bit deeper towards the winter, but sure. But we're getting ahead of ourselves now. I said I didn't want to get too far ahead. We're getting too <laughs> far ahead. So we got to put a bow on this 2024 season. And again, a crown on top of the Minnesota windchill. Hats off to all the players, coaches, the organization, the fans, Minnesota's fans. Uh, shout out to my mom, Laura Ruffner. She'll be listening to this super Minnesota windchill fan. That's that's a little bit of an insult to me as somebody who's come up through the Mass and Radicals organization, but <laughs> also a testament to how much fun the Windchill games are and that whole atmosphere has been the past several years. So again, hats off to the entirety of the Minnesota Windchill and their successes this season, and also hats off to the other 23 teams. It's been a remarkable run this year. It's been the most chaotic season of them all. I feel like I can really drill home and put a period on the end of that chaos season statement because oh, man yeah. <laughs> especially with i mean the when i showed up and the weather was what it was in salt lake i'm like if this doesn't scream into the chaos season narrative i don't know what does well we'll have to see what next season reveals i know last year uh audience members listening to the show right now we took a 
very decided break in the off season as we kind of got situated in the background between new hosts and everything else. That will not be happening going into this off season. Cam and I will be sticking with you more regularly. We will take a bit of a break after this episode. We might not come back next week, but we will come back in short order because in not too long, there will be the decision of end of season awards and all of that hoopla. There was already the Players' Choice Awards mentioned at the beginning of last week, uh, the week prior, excuse me. Or no, last week, last week, like a week ago. Uh, We haven't touched on those. We'll definitely touch on those in in a future episode. But for now, we will bid you adieu and the 2024 season goodbye as we, I, I don't know, celebrate? Do we celebrate this? I've, I've been remote, man. I've been watching everything through green. <laughs> I feel completely uncathartic, and yet this is one of the most exciting seasons that we've had. And so just want to say a quick thank you to everyone. A huge thank you to you, Cameron, for co-hosting the show with me. And we will be back in not too long on Swing Pass to do what else but talk more Pro Ultimate Frisbee in the association. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.